Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to uh, CCDBR's um, conference, surveillance conference, No Place to Hide, the Rise of Surveillance, State, and its Threat to the Bill of Rights. Um, my name is Brian Orozco. I am on the board of CCDBR. And uh, just a quick little summary, this organization is dedicated to um, spreading awareness about government abuses in every form, whether it's police brutality, whether it's uh, abuse of the courts, um, and including surveillance by uh, government officials. Um, that is what our organization is dedicated to doing. Um, so we are happy to present, or actually very proud to present uh, these panelists here to talk about uh, an issue that needs to have more publicity and we really need to get the word out for. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, did Brian introduce me? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Bob Clark, the president of the Chicago Committee uh, to Defend the Bill of Rights. And we're going to get right into the program here. Uh, you all know uh, why you're here. And uh, so I won't have to tell you that we're concerned about hyper surveillance and its threat to civil liberties. And we've assembled what I think is a really great panel. Would it help you if you had a little more light to look at your programs? Because you can, I think, see, this. we're going to do several videos that I think you'll see better uh, without the room light on. So if you can kind of manage with your programs with the existing light, you'll, uh, you'll probably have a better experience. And um, Mike, uh, uh, I, I wanted to introduce Mike German first, because I didn't tell him this, but <laughs> Brian, uh, Costola, who was to be one of our speakers, was unable to come because of a family obligation. We have a video presentation from him that he gave me yesterday afternoon. Uh, but he suggested that Mike speak first because of the content of his video presentation. I haven't seen it, so I don't know the rationale for that, but I'm sure it's valid. So uh, our first speaker has flown in from Washington, uh, D.C., from the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, uh, Mike German. Uh, you have his bio information on the program. Mike participated in the surveillance program that CCDBR did four and a half years ago in the same building in a different uh, facility upstairs. So this, by the way, is his law school alma mater. So he's back on familiar territory. And I'll let Mike begin. Well, thanks very and much. And be sure to speak into that small mic, too. So Thank, thanks very much, Bob. and. Uh, uh, thanks to CCDBR for hosting us. Um, I did indeed go to law school here, so it's nice, always nice to come back to Chicago uh, and be in this beautiful building. I had my first criminal procedure class in this room, so I feel very comfortable here. I did well in that class. <laughs> uh, uh, and part of uh, the reason why I did well is because I wanted to go into the FBI after I left law school, and that's what I did and was an FBI agent for 16 years. Uh, and worked terrorism for 12 of those years uh, and was um, not surprised uh, when September 11th uh, revealed the problems within the FBI and the intelligence community writ large uh, that made it difficult for them to manage the amount of information that they were collecting. And what troubled me right after 9-11 was that instead of addressing the issues that made it difficult for them to analyze and disseminate and share information, what they did is suggest that the problem was a lack of collection authority. So they re uh, released the, these agencies from the standard traditional legal uh, regimes that protected the privacy of innocent people while these agencies went and did their important job of going out and collecting information about people that we all want uh, to see them uh, collect evidence against and, and uh, prosecute. Um, and what I realized was that that was going to be a methodology that was both not going to work, that, uh, that the terrorists and criminals would still be able to go out and do what they were doing, but instead would uh, end up collecting a lot of information about people who are totally innocent and uh, specifically then allow the agencies to target the people who they're normally suspicious of uh, and improperly suspicious of, and those tend to be people who are challenging the status quo, right? So it's new immigrants, uh, it's, it's minority communities, minority religious communities, minority racial communities, 
and, of course, political dissidents or political activists. Um, and uh, I ended up leaving the FBI in 2004 uh, and in 2006 uh, joined the ACLU, Washington Legislative Office, where I work on national security policy. Um, this has been an issue that we've been working on since September 11th, and obviously the first uh, major change to the law was the Patriot Act, uh, which was passed a little more than a month after 9-11. Uh, changing a lot of the, the legal restrictions and the legal rules around secretive uh, surveillance practices through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And you may have been reading quite a bit about them recently because after a dozen years of, of incredible secrecy surrounding that type of surveillance, uh, despite our and, and uh, our colleagues in D.C., EPIC, and, and a number of other groups, um, warnings about what would happen with these programs that were operating completely in the dark. Uh, what we found is that the incredible scope, based on the leak of an NSA contractor, Edward Snowden, uh, who had to risk jail and, and de facto exile in order to tell the American public what its government was doing to the American public, which is really uh, not the way our system is supposed to work. Um, and, and what it revealed is extremely troubling. I mean, you know, we complained when the Patriot Act changed an authority called Section 215, which was what the intelligence community likened to a grand jury subpoena in the national intelligence scheme. So just like a criminal investigator can go to a grand jury and, and ask for a subpoena that gives them authority to go collect documents about whatever criminal they're investigating, this would al had allowed uh, intelligence agents to go and collect information about people they were tracking because they thought they were a spy or a terrorist. So they changed the standard down to relevance, which is very low. So instead of being using this only against people that were actually suspects, they could use it against anybody they deemed relevant. And what we found, we thought that standard was way too low and, and would end up targeting a lot of innocent people, even if you used the normal legal definition of relevance. But what we found through these leaks is relevant uh, had, had transitioned over the years, but basically means everything. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's really interesting to read the, the legal opinions that have now been released from the secret court that, that issues these orders to see how they sort of worm around this idea that somehow collecting all the telephone data, calling data of all Americans is somehow necessary and relevant to the work that they're doing. Um, and, you know, thankfully for us, because for, for 12 years uh, we had this problem where they would say, Where, where's the evidence of abuse? Where's the evidence of abuse in a secret program? Hard to, hard to argue why, where the evidence of abuse was, but now, uh, thanks to Edward Snowden, there is considerable evidence of abuse and new evidence coming out every week as, as new material is being published. So I think it's really changed the situation in Washington, D.C. There are now at, at least 25 bills moving through Congress that would address this in some way, some better than others. Uh, but, but it has really changed the dynamic considerably. So I think we're very hopeful right now that we can start to put some meaningful reforms on these programs and, and more importantly, start talking about this in a very different way uh, so that we're not just talking about hypothetical problems but, but demonstrating to the American public that these are real. So I'm happy to be here at the panel and uh, happy to address any questions that you have. Um, you know, and again, one of the things to keep in mind is that the, the NSA spying that Edward Snowden has revealed is only one aspect of a growing surveillance society and, and only one agency or a couple of agencies, the FBI and the CIA, are, have access to this material too. Uh, but you also have, you know, a, a, the technological revolution has changed the way data is stored. So where uh, when I started working in the FBI, we would subpoena records and they would come to you in a, 
in a box and you would put the box in the evidence room and, and use it for the case that you're using and then either return it or forget about it and it would go into the archives where now all that data is easily accessible constantly. Every agent through this computer has access to all the types of information being collected across all different investigative activities. So the amount of data that they can hold on you uh, without having, you know, there was the old saying when I first joined the FBI, everybody would say, you know, will you tell me what's in my FBI file? <laughs> uh, and, you know, today they don't need to have an FBI file, right? You have, there's so much data about you, whether from the telephone uh, metadata program or from surveillance cameras uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit today, that they can pull it together with the touch of a button. Right? It doesn't have to be a file. Uh, Keith Alexander, the NSA director, made a big point of saying, we don't have dossiers on American people. <laughs> well, they probably don't have a physical dossier, but they have all the telephone calls we've made for the last 10 years. So that's, that's a pretty significant amount of information that's very revealing about who we associate with and types of activities we're involved in. So we're, we want to make sure that uh, our Fourth Amendment rights are protected and that information is is not being collected for no reason so. thanks mike and i want to emphasize so you understand we're going to have a lot of provision for your questions and comments uh after we hear from a couple more speakers so there'll be plenty of uh, opportunity for you to participate in in this program uh, a couple of other things i wanted to mention you may wonder why i just said i was turning the lights on and then turn the uh, off and then turn the back on uh, it was because our wonderful friends from Can TV, Channel 19, who are here, needed a little more light for their pickup. So that's why those lights are on. And um, by the way, let me tell you that um, Can TV, who are recording this program, uh, broadcast that several times on Channel 19. And if you consult their schedule, you'll be able to watch these proceedings in an edited form. Uh, one of the wonderful services that they perform uh, for this community. Uh, I'd like to mention also that uh, we are doing a live webcast of this program, so there are people not in this room who are watching at various points. Uh, it surprised me to find out that we have people watching the program in Shanghai, in um, Arusha, in Tanzania, uh, and in Wisconsin, and, uh, and some other exotic locations. So uh, uh, there are quite a few people who, even though we have a rather late notice of the link for the live stream are tuned in. And uh, in advance, a few people sent me questions that we'll perhaps come to uh, later uh, to supplement the ones that, that you'll raise. In your programs, there also is a glossary of some terms and acronyms associated with surveillance that uh, I have to admit I threw together at 2.30 this morning. There are some shortcomings in there that various experts on the panel will correct uh, as we go along, but some of the basic terminology that you'll hear used here uh, in the program is uh, taken up uh, in that sheet. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I don't see Chris here, and I wonder if Amy can activate the uh, Kevin tape. Kevin Gustol, as I told you, could not come, so he prepared this yesterday uh, for the panel, and he wanted it to follow Mike's comments. Let's get into this uh, discussion, this brief discussion. I want to open on surveillance, whistleblowers, and threats to freedom of the press. Uh, the main point I want to begin with is that we have a right to know the information that is central to a lot of these leak investigations. If government officials have gone after people, whistleblowers, or leakers, and it has targeted journalists who received those leaks or received the information from those whistleblowers, and this is because they don't want that information to get out to us. And one of the favorite things that the officials who are defending leak investigations like to say is that this is information that could have done enormous grave damage, or it could have led adversaries to change tactics, or could have meant that uh, we would be attacked, or uh, something that uh, is going to make it impossible for the government to do its job, uh, quote unquote, protecting national security. These are wild allegations, this is wild speculation, and, and we have to require that officials who make these sort of statements back up what they are alleging, wildly, because 
99.99% of the time it is found out that what they are saying is just simply not true. There is no reason for us to accept this fact that risks of national security are going to be caused. But however, this is a key barrier, I think, to convincing citizens that it is okay for us to know what our government is doing when they are fighting uh, counterterrorism operations, um, when they are engaged in surveillance, um, when they are engaged in uh, detention or interrogations of prisoners. It's something that we, I think, have been conditioned to feel like this is information we shouldn't be concerned about because it could be bad uh, for the country if we show too much interest. And now to get to some quick examples here. Back in May 2012, we heard about how the Associated Press had had records seized by the Justice Department. And in that case, you can see clearly this great example of how the government is mounting these leak investigations that broadly seize up the communication records of journalists, and it's not targeted. But in fact, what happens is it ends up chilling the whole news gathering process because it is going after, in this case, in the AP case, you had 20 phone lines that about 100 journalists were using. And clearly, that involved people who had nothing to do with the story at stake. And what they were concerned about is that there had been a leak related to a CIA underwear bomb flat sting operation in Yemen. And so uh, they mounted this investigation here and they subpoenaed these records, but they did not notify the Associated Press. So there was no opportunity for the AP to negotiate about getting information to the government that could have possibly helped with this investigation to maybe locate the person who was responsible for the leak. Uh, Fox News reporter James Rosen, in an FBI affidavit, you could see how the government had gone through all of his communications, the uh, phone lines, the emails that he had sent to a former State Department employee named Stephen Kim. Um, and in this case, this apparently involved a story related to a nuclear program in North Korea, and they labeled Rosen an aider, a better, and co-conspirator of a leak. Um, basically accused him of somehow being involved in violating the Espionage Act. Uh, this Espionage Act is a World War I era law that the Obama administration has been using to a greater extent than any presidential administration in this history. There have been um, at least eight people who have been prosecuted under this act. Um, and in all those cases, you see these individuals going to media organizations. Um, so all of them, for the most part, establishment media organizations. The only one that isn't is WikiLeaks in the case of uh, Chelsea Manning. And so uh, you see that they're using this law to come down. And in this case, they went after Rosen. David Sanger of the New York Times is involved in a leak investigation because he published a story on Stuxnet, which is this virus that was used in a cyber attack on Iran's nuclear infrastructure. And he detailed this in his book, Confront and Conceal, wrote about it in a story for the New York Times. And the effect on him for being involved in this leak investigation is, as he said in a recent report put out by the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, and he said, a memo went out from the chief of staff a year ago to White House employees and the intelligence agency that told people to freeze and retain any email and presumably phone logs of communications with me. And basically, uh, sources are no longer willing to talk to him and say, David, I love you, but don't email me. Let's don't chat until this blows over. In the case of Scott Shane, the New York Times reporter, he was involved in a, a, a leak investigation because he had conversations with former CIA officer John Kiriakou, who is right now in prison serving a 30-month sentence for violating the Intelligence Identities and Protection Act. And so he basically found out that seemingly innocuous emails not containing classified information could be construed as a crime. I mean, he was basically having conversations that he believed to be unclassified, and 
that it turned out that those emails were swept up, his communications, and you find that his ability to work as a reporter is being chilled. Now, the government is willing to go after reporters who are working outside of the United States. They're even willing to enlist the help of a telecommunications company in order to collect records of communications so that they can engage in leaked investigations. And a clear example, you should go look for this story on ProPublica.org. It's titled, How a Telecom Helped the Government Spy on Me. It was written by New York Times reporter Raymond Bonner. Uh, and he uh, wrote up this whole thing about how he had done a story on American teachers who were killed in West Papua, which is a remote re region of Indonesia. Um, and it was believed that a separatist group, the Free Papua Movement, had been responsible for those deaths of the teachers. It turned out that the Bush administration had figured out that Indonesian soldiers were behind the killings. They even had sent FBI agents to look into what had happened. And when that detail was published in the New York Times, that touched off an investigation. And you had the telecommunications company working with the government to circumvent surveillance laws and, and, and engineer ways that they could get to the records in Indonesia, get landline records, and um, they ended up sweeping up a 22-month period, which was very, very broad, and collecting thousands of calls, uh, data on thousands of calls that Bonner um, and a New York Times reporter and a couple other Washington Post reporters who had reported on the story, they got that information as well. Uh, and, and a final case that I want to bring up is the case of James Risen, a New York Times reporter who has uh, been uh, put in this situation where he has to testify against his source in a league investigation into whether Jeffrey Sterling, a former CIA officer, uh, violated the Espionage Act. And uh, in this case, you can see in the indictment, which goes back to 2002, how the government developed uh, and was using the surveillance apparatus to collect information from call records and <laughs> from emails. And in this case, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's really amazing to see how the government is using this information so broadly to go after Ryzen to the extent to which now the New York Times has actually taken him off of the National Secur Security Agency beat that he had been on uh, and which he had been doing effectively by covering uh, the Bush warrantless wiretapping program. Although recently he did just publish a great interview with Edward Snowden. This whole thing of launching leak investigations, it really picked up in 2009 when Dennis Blair, the director, the then director of national intelligence before James, uh, who gives the least untruthful answers, Clapper took over. Uh, he, in his position, decided uh, that he wanted to pursue these leaks because in the past uh, four years, there was a record of 153 cases going to the Justice Department. And in those instances, none of those cases had led to an indictment. So he believed that something had to change. There needed to be an aggressive strategy developed. And so you have seen the Obama administration develop this aggressive strategy, even though it has made this claim of being the most transparent administration ever. And in the aftermath of the WikiLeaks disclosure, the publications of information that came from Chelsea Manning, you had an insider threat program launched. And I think I'd like to wrap up by uh, reading a bit about this insider threat program that was put in place and basically show you this uh, example of neo-McCarthyism that is happening inside government and is really, really chilling the news gathering process because you have employees whose free speech rights are being directly targeted and they're not able to talk about what they do in their jobs at all and I don't think that this is something that we would accept or should accept uh, and inside of government, essentially now, um, they have developed courses where they look into individuals who might be willing to commit treason. And uh, if you go to the story that McClatchy, 
newspapers did on the entire threat program, what you will read about is how uh, they have developed this way of uh, conditioning employees to look for antisocial personality disorders in individuals, look for evidence of individuals who are narcissists. Um, as I'll describe here, and this, this comes from an actual site that is constructed and it, we're supposed to take it as being informative, um, what the site says is uh, that the psychology of spies is that these people are usually manipulative, self-serving, and seek immediate gratification of their desires. They are oriented toward what they can get uh, with little interest in the future, and there's no interest in learning from the past. They have little capacity to form attachments or to develop a commitment to anyone or anything. This suggests that their ability to develop any degree of loyalty is seriously compromised. Narcissists, those are people who, quote, feel undervalued by their supervisor or their organization and generally need to defend themselves against feelings of inadequacy. They may respond in ways that are rebellious, passive aggressive, or vindictive. They may also seek out some other source for validation and affirmation of their self-perceived abilities or importance. In some cases, they have turned to a foreign intelligence service to fulfill their emotional needs, gaining satisfaction from working as a spy and outsmarting the organization that devalued them. And it goes on, it says, in the antisocial personality and the narcissist, may engage in deliberate behavior that violates routine security rules and regulations, but they do this for different reasons. Antisocial personality people reject the rules. A narcissist accepts the rules, but believes he or she is so special that the rules do not apply. They only apply to others. And this is why any deliberate security violation, such as taking classified reports home, or giving classified information to an unauthorized person, is a serious security concern even if no real damage is done. Any deliberate violation is evidence of an unwillingness or inability to abide, abide by the rules that can have broad implications. Now, um, what must be said here as I wrap up my talk is that uh, the larger issues that we really need to look at with all that we know about NSA surveillance with all that we know about what the Obama administration's record has been on leak investigations, is that just about anybody who is a potential source of a news organization could seemingly have their data swept up into databases of the NSA. And if they believe that any of that content or if they believe any of that metadata connects to a crime, they can technically go into that information and forward it on to law enforcement for an investigation. That is how much power and leeway they have with the surveillance that they are conducting. And these are surveillance programs. Whatever Senator Dianne Feinstein might say, these are surveillance programs that we are talking about when we're talking about the collection of this data or metadata. It may not be the content, but it can in many ways show us much more uh, about our, our, our lives than just the content of, of any communications, the metadata. And so to conclude, I would say that if the Obama administration really wants to uh, get rid of this dynamic, this uncomfortable tension where they're being put under the scrutiny for all of these leak investigations that they are launching, they should really stop doing those things behind closed doors which make people want to blow the whistle, which make people want to show the public that there is corruption and abuse going on behind closed doors. Uh, I should mention, in case you don't know, that Kevin was one of the very few journalists who completely covered the oh, Chel uh, Chelsea man. Oh. <laughs> he tends to repeat himself quite a bit. <laughs> okay, thanks. Anyway, Kevin was one of the few journalists who covered the Chelsea Manning trial from beginning to end, and he deserves a lot of credit for that because the American media establishment uh, blanked that out pretty heavily. And uh, uh, I also would like to note from what he just said that although we focus a lot on the privacy Fourth Amendment issues here, he was raising some very disturbing First Amendment 
uh, free expression concerns in what he just said that we also want to uh, keep track of. Uh, surveillance is uh, obviously uh, an issue in protection of uh, free expression. And uh, we'll move on to uh, two presentations that relate to the title of this conference, No Place to Hide. Um, one of them focused on our scene here in Chicago and another one more generally on drone surveillance and other high technology uh, surveillance. Um, we have Adam Schwartz with us at the end of the table here from the uh, Illinois American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Adam has developed a special uh, tracking of camera surveillance in Chicago and I know a lot of us are interested in that topic. It's received a lot of publicity uh, because of speed cameras and red light cameras, but we're really not talking primarily about those. So I'll ask Adam to tell us what, what he has to, to present today, and uh, please do. So good afternoon, I'm Adam Schwartz. Uh, I'd like to thank the CCDBR for holding this event, and it's a real honor and pleasure to be here today. Chicago has, uh, according to um, Homeland Security uh, former director, um, Michael Chertoff, the uh, most uh, expansive and integrated system of surveillance cameras uh, anywhere in the country. Um, while it is a secret, the number of cameras that uh, Chicago has access to, um, the best indication today is that there are some 20,000 uh, cameras um, that are integrated into one nerve center uh, in Chicago known as the Office of Emergency Management and Communication. This is uh, a technological revolution. Nothing like this existed uh, 10 years ago. This scope of cameras blanketing uh, entire neighborhoods of Chicago, the downtown area of Chicago, um, and all integrated into one place. Uh, in addition to these massive numbers and tight integration, there are very sophisticated technologies. Uh, Chicago in the last year has acquired uh, facial recognition as part of its camera system. So they can run images that are captured by their 20,000 cameras against databases of uh, face shots uh, uh, held by various government agencies. They also have an automatic tracking function where they can put, uh, for example, a license plate number um, into the system and press go and see where that car has been and the system can automatically align all the captured images from all the different cameras in chronological order so you can see the car leaving the effective range of one camera and entering the effective range of the next camera. Now what these technologies um, are significant for um, is the empowerment of government to quickly and cheaply and easily and secretly monitor where everybody is uh, whenever they are in public. Uh, unfortunately, the surveillance cameras are not the only technology like this. We, of course, are dealing with uh, cell phone tracking, GPS tracking, automatic license plate reader tracking, uh, the drones, uh, which my, my fellow panelists will, will speak about. Uh, in the 20th century, you know, fortunately, we never got to the point as a society where law enforcement had enough manpower to keep track of where everybody was. But with these new technologies, we have shattered that threshold. Um, again, quickly, cheaply, easily, we potentially have uh, room for uh, universal monitoring of, of where we are in public. Now, from the perspective of the ACLU, this is very disturbing for a few reasons. Uh, number one, we believe that part of uh, uh, our right to privacy includes the right to go about our day um, without being uh, surveilled and uh, there being a record of what we've been doing. So have we gone to church? Have we gone to a bar? Did we go to see a criminal defense lawyer or a psychiatrist or a fertility clinic? Are we visiting with members of the opposition uh, political party? Are we seeing a controversial movie? Did we go to a protest? All of the things uh, that we think we should be free to do without the government tracking what we're doing um, are transparently available to the government uh, with the use of uh, these currently existing technologies uh, like the cameras. In addition to the privacy dimension, there also, of course, is a First Amendment dimension. Uh, which is that if the government directs these technologies towards protests in public place, whether it's pickets or leafleting or, or demonstrations, there is a tendency uh, to, uh, for people to be chilled and not want to go and attend these events if they are concerned that doing so will get themselves into uh, a government database. Now, sadly, Chicago has a history here. Um, the infamous Red Squad of the 1930s through uh, you know, the, the 1980s um, where it was standard operating procedure, for uh, example, 
for police to stand outside political demonstrations and write down the license plate numbers of people who are coming. Well now, potentially, it is uh, a lot cheaper, easier, and quicker to do this. You don't even need the officer to stand there if you have the right technology. Uh, there are existing Chicago police regulations uh, regarding First Amendment surveillance, uh, and in particular uh, for demonstrations. And what they say is that a supervisor can direct the city's 20,000 cameras at First Amendment activity if they believe they have a legitimate law enforcement purpose, uh, which we consider to be a nebulous and insufficient standard which does not require reasonable suspicion of crime. Uh, so it's effectively a fishing expedition. And we have um, asked the city, uh, unfortunately, to no avail to, uh, to correct that standard, which unfortunately is a problem, not just with these new technologies, but with an array of other um, law enforcement uh, approaches. So when we talk about these uh, Bill of Rights costs, our privacy, uh, the potential chill on the First Amendment, the question arises, well, what is the benefit of uh, these cameras? And it is often said that they make a difference in keeping our streets safer. Um, the ACLU uh, is not greatly persuaded by that. Um, there have been many statistical studies of whether or not the putting up of these kinds of surveillance cameras deter street-level crime. And uh, virtually without exception, they have found that, in fact, a violent crime is not reduced and uh, only to some marginal degree might property crimes be uh, reduced in some cases, for example, in, in, in parking lots. Well, do they help uh, make arrests? Well, Chicago police's own data shows that less than 1% of all of the arrests in the city of Chicago have anything to do with the surveillance cameras. Uh, and, and this is happening at a time where we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, well, in excess of 100 million in Chicago, on these cameras. We simultaneously have 2,000 vacancies in the Chicago Police Department. And you know, I, for one, would feel safer with another police officer in my neighborhood um, as opposed to spending the money on, on, on the high-tech gadgets. The final aspect of whether the cameras are protecting us from street crime is whether or not they are assisting in uh, prosecutions and convictions. And there are statements by the uh, spokesperson for the Cook County State's Attorney's Office that, in fact, the uh, captured images have not helped uh, with virtually any prosecutions. <laughs> there is, of course, uh, in addition to street-level crime, the question of terrorism. Um, it's hard to prove uh, you know, the counterfactual that these have prevented uh, or not prevented um, a terrorist attack. Uh, it is um, reasonably clear that uh, cameras can uh, play a role, as in Boston, um, in catching the terrorist after the fact, um, which is you know, a, a factor that should be considered. But that said, they did not, uh, as far as we know, stop the attack. So ultimately, the question is, what do we want to do about that? Well, at the ACLU, um, there, there's three things we want. Uh, the first is we want to restrain um, uh, when it is these technologies are in use. Um, given the um, incredibly uh, hazard, uh, the great hazard to our privacy posed by the automatic tracking and by the uh, facial recognition, we think that the government should not be allowed to use these technologies um, to uh, do the facial recognition or the automatic tracking in the absence of probable cause of a crime. Uh, the standard that's used by police officers on the street to arrest somebody. Uh, and we think that they should not use the zoom function, uh, which is also very powerful, uh, to see what people are doing in the absence of reasonable sus suspicion of a crime, the standard that police officers use to uh, briefly detain people. And we think that the camera should not be aimed at any First Amendment activity, uh, from the lone uh, picketer through the large demonstration, again in the absence of reasonable suspicion. So the second thing we want is a lot more transparency. Uh, again, it is a secret in Chicago uh, how many cameras we have, um, whether or not there have been allegations of abuse in the use of these cameras, how much money has been spent on the cameras, um, and, and really this ought to be uh, out in the public domain. Um, we um, sponsored a bill which unfortunately did not pass two years ago, which would have required some of this basic reporting. And, and there really is no reason, we don't think, to, to keep this a secret. Uh, it should be up to the public to, to see the information and weigh the costs and benefits and, and, and be part of the dialogue. Uh, and that brings us to, uh, to means number three, um, uh, what we want, which is there to be a more deliberate process before we start putting up more cameras. Uh, we think before a camera goes up in someone's neighborhood, there ought to be notice to the people in the neighborhood, an opportunity to comment. Um, what, what we really have in Chicago is um, a small number of top executive officials um, making these decisions to, to spend all this money to put up all these cameras with all of the potential invasion of privacy and, and without a sufficient uh, a public dialogue. Uh, I, I want to conclude um, by just with a few observations about uh, technology and liberty. 
Um, I, I think there can be a tendency um, when we talk about all of these technologies which are so menacing um, to our liberty, whether it's these NSA metadata databases or the fusion centers or the cameras or the drones, um, to think that technology um, is uh, per se the problem. Um, in fact, I think many of these technologies have the great opportunity to make us more free. So the very cell phone, which can be used against us as a tracking device, also can be used by us to document what government officials are doing. Uh, so for example, there has been uh, a lot of litigation across the country led by uh, the ACLU and others uh, to vindicate a First Amendment right for civilians to use the uh, audio video devices uh, on their phones to document police civilian encounters and uh, thereby to discourage police misconduct and uh, to document where it occurs. Uh, another example, of course, would be uh, encryption technologies, which have the power to uh, protect the privacy of our communications uh, from snooping by, by government or by others. Uh, and, and so uh, by raising these objections about uh, technologies, it does not make us Luddites. We're not trying to undo the, the technological revolution. Rather, um, we have to ensure that we put the uh, safeguards in place uh, to ensure that uh, these technologies make us uh, more free and, and not less free. Uh, so again, thanks everyone for being here, and I'm happy to talk about all of this uh, and more in, in the questions and answers. Thanks, Adam. And uh, I'll turn this mic for in here. Um, uh, our, our next and final speaker in this panel, after which we'll have your questions and participation, is uh, Amy Stepanovich from the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, D.C., another one of our out-of-town visitors. And uh, I want to thank her especially for all the help she's offered in the technological side of our operation today, as you saw a moment ago. So, uh, Amy, proceed on the drones and related issues. Hi, so my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the director of the Domestic Surveillance Project at a small nonprofit in Washington, D.C. called the Electronic Privacy Information Center. EPIC has been around since 1994, and we were formed to educate the public on emerging issues in privacy and civil liberties as they, as they associate with technology. And that has made me very busy in 2013 um, because there, there is no shortage of issues that impact our privacy and our civil liberties. So I wanted to start with um, a question of how, at what point do we just accept surveillance? Um, I heard a story earlier this year from somebody I was on a panel with where in the, the United Kingdom, they actually do very in-depth aerial imaging of the entire country every single year. And as a result of that, they take incredibly high resolution photographs and they give copies of those photographs, of copies of um, the tops of people's houses or towns to children. And the children are able to get these awesome photographs of their areas that they can put on their wall. And it makes them accept the fact that this survey happens every single year. And to me, that was amazing. At what point do we say it's OK that they're collecting large amounts of in information about individuals because we think maybe we're benefiting out of it, even if it's only by virtue of getting this really cool picture to put on our, our child's wall? Um, so we're teaching that technology is cool and that surveillance is cool, but we're not teaching the implications of that surveillance. And just to be clear, I don't think anybody is saying, um, well, no, I, I'll not say that. I am not saying at this point in time now, anything that the Bush administration did or could have done was bad. I'm not saying that anything that the Obama administration did or could have, did, could have done, could do, is bad. And I'm not saying anything that the person who's elected in 2016 is going to do is necessarily bad. Because I don't think that's necessarily the problem here. It's that we're setting up architecture that could lead to a surveillance state at a level that nobody has seen before. Somebody has also said to me earlier this year that the information that's being taken in by the NSA would have made the Stasi salivate. They would have loved that. I'm not saying that we are the Stasi. I'm saying that the architecture is there for a society that's incredibly dangerous to individuals. So we've heard a bit, and I'm sure we're going to hear more, about how the NSA is conducting tracking of your information online, how your communications, your online interactions um, are kept in a database, stored, and used to, um, well, used in a, in a variety of different contexts. But I want to talk a little bit about physical world surveillance, um, what some people call low-tech, but I, I definitely think that's a misnomer because these are incredibly high-tech devices that are used to 
track us in the physical world and then can be used to connect us to our virtual world presence. So there's actually no line between the two anymore. Um, we have devices that we carry on us that allows, a, allows the government and allows private industry to track our location, our movements, our activities. You heard a lot about that, um, about what activities can be tracked and why that's a, why that's a problem. And these are, are the surveillance cameras. These are our cell phones, which we carry around with us voluntarily and yet give a tremendous amount of information, personal information about us over to a third party. But I'm going to talk about drones, and I'm going to talk about drones because I think they are, are the one platform that's out there right now that's going to survive, combine almost every surveillance technology we know about, every physical world surveillance technology we know about, into a pervasive surveillance machine. Um, drones are actually designed, this is what dis, um, differentiates them from traditional aerial surveillance vehicles. They are designed to conduct surveillance. They come built with cameras and an array of other technology that I'm going to discuss in just a second. And as I was at a conference last weekend, there were, there were two questions posed to a panel. One was, how do we get over the idea that drones are cool? And then five seconds later, as soon as the panel answered that, somebody raised their hand and said, OK, but how do we get over the perception that drones are scary? And the thing is, is that drones aren't either cool or scary, but we need to talk about what we can do with them and what we shouldn't be able to do with them, because they do allow an entire new world of information to be collected. Um, some of the technologies that are, are being or are about to be deployed on drones, we have facial recognition technology. The Department of Defense has spent a lot of money trying to figure out how to put facial recognition on drones so that they can use it amongst other things at the border. Um, one of the bills in Congress right now would require 24-hour drone surveillance along the southwest border being conducted by the Customs and Border Protection Agency. They have Stingray um, technology. This is fake, a fake cell phone tower to triangulate your location using your cell phone, whether or not you are making a phone call. Um, automated license plate readers that collect the license plate number of your f um, car and can put it into a database to track your movements. And technology that you're going to hear a lot about in the future, but not so much just yet, called terahertz technology. Terahertz scanners can scan you as you walk down the street. They're basically the equivalent of an electronic frisk and tell exactly what you're carrying down to very small trace amounts that you may have come into contact by brushing against somebody earlier in the day. They're incredibly um, revealing, but very, have a very low intrusive value because they can be, you can be scanned from very far away. Um, the drones that carry these technologies, and there, some of them are deployed now, the technology is expanding at an exponentially fast rate. They can be very small. They can be as large as a 747 and fly very high in the air out of, out of range of sight. And most concerning is that they can fly in areas that were just off limits to traditional aerial vehicles. They can get very close to your home, can get underneath um, overhangs into buildings in some occasions. There are drones that are as small as a hummingbird and they're being developed to be as small as a mosquito in some cases, although getting the surveillance equipment on those drones has proven quite difficult. Um, and they, they can track you forever. Um, they can fly in the air. They're exploring technology that would allow a drone to fly in the sky perpetually with never, without ever having to come down to be recharged. So these are devices that can just stay up, um, keeping track of people's movements perpetually. The drone industry likes to say that they're a game changer. They are definitely a game changer. They bring a whole new face to the world of physical surveillance. But then, very, very quickly, the drone industry will also say that they're no different from other aerial surveillance vehicles, and we don't need to regulate them any more than we've ever regulated an airplane or a helicopter, which are both incredibly expensive to operate, incredibly time-consuming, and need a large amount of training. A drone can be thrown up in the air in mere, in mere minutes, piloted from the ground using a, the equivalent of a video game controller or your cell phone. Um, and they don't take much training. You can get the training to operate a drone in a half day, the last time I checked. So it's, it's amazing what the technology is going to be able to do. A piece of, a, a camera that's now being developed and used by the, the Department of Defense, and in a very short amount of time, I'm sure, will be available on the commercial market called Argus, can film an entire city from one camera down to a blade of grass. 
It's incredibly high resolution. It can zoom in to see um, in startling clarity everything in an entire city. And somebody has proposed having one of these cameras over every US city so that they can track movements of everybody in a city at a time. And then those f video feeds can be leased out to people who want to look at the feeds. So the police can access a feed if they want to. Google can access a feed. Um, your neighbor, if he or she can afford it, if we don't know what this business model would look like, would be able to access a feed on an entire city, tracking people as they go about their everyday lives. So a few, the, the, the question I want to end with, and I started with the question of when do we accept surveillance, I'm going to end with the question of will we have privacy in this future, and a future of NSA surveillance and drones? And that's the question, and the question is not, and it's purposefully, is not, is privacy dead? Because privacy cannot die, because we can take it back, and we can stop the movement toward surveillance, and start a movement toward a more protective and a more um, privacy-enhancing, free speech-enhancing society. And I think it's very easy to get into this defeatist state of mind where you think they have the information, they're never going to stop having the information, they're never going to stop these programs. But there is a movement forming, and in large thanks to the revelations that have been made this summer, to say that this is not acceptable anymore, that we can accept surveillance. And I think it's key for, for everybody here, and I think this is a first step for some and maybe a sixth or seventh step for others, to be involved and to be informed and to know what's going on and to know what technology is there and to know what you can do. And even if it's making a comment on a blog post or making a call to your senator or representative, the pressure that you put on people to put the right policies and the right technologies and the right laws in place to protect rights in the future is going to have such an incre be so, so incredibly important um, that I can't emphasize it enough. So um, thank you. Don't accept surveillance, and I'll turn it over to Bob. Okay. So we have Jonathan. A very specific question: How good is the facial recognition software being used? Like I've used consumer versions of facial recognition recognition software on my photo album, and they're not very good. Like, what kind of accuracy are we talking about with the what like the city of Chicago uses? It currently has an incredibly high error rate. Just the reason I perked up right away is just two weeks ago, Epic got documents from the FBI about their error rate in their facial recognition technology that shows how high it is. Um, however, that error rate goes down dramatically when you have a higher sampling. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to get as many faces into the database as possible, as many times as possible, because that's what helps them um, raise their accuracy of their um, recognition. Notably, the largest biometric database for faces in the entire world is owned by Facebook. And it's an open question right now um, under what's showing the government could get access to that database. Um, because if they find um, that it's relevant to a terrorism investigation for them to have access to the entire database, and that they find that it is in fact a business record, which it, it is under 215 under the definitions, they could probably get the entire database transferred over to the NSA unless we stop them from this interpretation that they have. And just one final note on that, they are, now, they are right now, the government is performing a study in a, hockey, a public hockey rink for a professional team um, on the West Coast where they are scanning every face that comes into the hockey rink um, through certain exits. They say that if you don't want to be scanned, you can use a different exit. Um, to determine, renew, with a renewed um, interest toward determining now what the error rates would be. So they're looking at this a little bit further, but there are public studies happening to get the error rates on facial recognition down. Anyone else wanted to comment on that? Well, I should just say that in Boston, um, the, the Sarnia brothers were not identified by the FBI's face, face recognition programs, even though uh, the elder brother, Tamerlan, was arrested in Massachusetts in 2009, and so his mugshot was in the FBI's CJIS database. And the younger brother had a Massachusetts driver's license. So those are pretty good quality images, um, and they didn't work. So that was not that long ago. Uh, Amy made a reference to 215. Do you want to explain that? Section 215 is actually, Mike described it at the beginning. It is a provision that was expanded under the Patriot Act 
that allow, it's what allows the government to get a hold of records when they believe they are relevant to an investigation um, of terrorism activity. But, but as I said, what we've seen in the secret interpretation of, of that from the secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, is that they have deemed all telephone metadata of all Americans as relevant. So we can imagine that there are other sort of bulk records collection, and this may be one of them that we haven't yet uh, learned about. And unless they do something to change that definition in the law, it, it could certainly be used to gather that type of information. Adam, did you want to I want to make one, one small observation in, in fairness to the Chicago uh, police's use of facial recognition. There are a lot of uh, really horrible potential uses, uh, for instance, scanning every face that goes by and keeping a record of it, scanning every face that goes by and comparing it to the wanted database, um, going to uh, all these databases uh, in, in Facebook, um, the Secretary of State's database of, of driver's license. Right now in Chicago, it's a much more limited uh, system. What they're doing is if they capture an image of a person who apparently is engaged in crime, uh, for example, a mugger, and they don't know who he is, they then uh, run that image against the Chicago Police's own existing database of mug shots of uh, arrested persons. Um, so <clears throat> while you know, we, we might be seeing the thin edge of the wedge, uh, we have not yet in Chicago gotten to um, the, the much more abusive um, potential uses of the facial recognition. And let me just add about sort of the question of effectiveness of all this sort of stuff. I mean, that's one of the, the real problems is that there's a lot of money to be made by companies who are providing this sort of technology. So they make big promises to the state and local authorities who are buying these things. And there's very little uh, public evidence that, that any of these things are effective. In fact, when the public evidence comes out, for instance, from the, the surveillance camera studies, Typically, it, it's not very helpful, and and you know so when these, you know some it's usually driven by some bad incident. You know for a politician or a police official, it's easy to say here's what I'm doing. I'm spending a lot of money on cameras, but if that's not actually an effective methodology, that's not a good investment. And there could be other methodologies that are better. So demanding that sort of public accountability of evaluations of these technologies, I think, is critically important. Recently, in my own neighborhood, uh, there was a Panera Cares was established. You know what that is? That's a branch of the Panera sandwich operation or food uh, purveyors, uh, where they charge only what people can pay. And it's a separate subdivision of Panera. There was a lot of opposition from uh, people who thought the wrong sort would be attracted to such a place. And uh, in response to that, the Panera uh, manager uh, promised the community organization that he would be installing uh, surveillance cameras with facial recognition capability uh, in case troublemakers were spotted uh, trying to get in after they'd caused trouble and uh, to satisfy this community opposition to helping poor people get food. Uh, and. Uh, what startled me when I talked to the manager after the meeting was that he told me the Chicago Police Department had approached him and asked to tie in to, to this camera. And uh, he said no. Hmm. But um, they did approach him privately without any public uh, notice of this. And I don't know how widespread that is or whether that's a common practice and whether most merchants or other people who operate these cameras are just feeding into these 20,000 uh, other police camera feeds? Uh, a common practice in Chicago is for the camera network to uh, wire in to uh, private holders of their own cameras. Uh, they sign a memorandum of understanding, uh, for example, with the uh, owner of the Willis Tower so that all the cameras uh, that are used for their own uh, purposes of protecting the property that happen to be aiming outwards um, are accessible to the city of Chicago. Um, however, um, at least the last time we looked at these, uh, these memorandum of agreement uh, two years ago, the rule was that the city of Chicago would not access those images um, except in an emergency. And so the, the theory is that in the event of a, um, you know, a terrorist attack or some other kind of mayhem, you would have that many more um, eyes available to the people at the, uh, uh, the 911 center to see what's going on. 
Um, I, I hadn't realized it had gotten uh, so ubiquitous that they're going to, you know, the, the, the storefront that has one camera, but, but apparently they, they are. I think there are many thousands of cameras at the very least that are, that are privately held and, and wired into the city's camera system in this fashion. Okay. Uh, Jay. Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, we've already brought up the Patriot Act uh, from the Bush administration, and now we have the National Defense Authorization Act under Obama, uh, and with all of Edward Snowden's revelations. Um, if we look at what drones and surveillance are being used for around the world, we just had the latest one this week, I don't remember the names, where this um, report was issued about how the NSA was using all this data to kill these alleged terrorists. And I just wonder what, if we're having drones over the US with all this massive metadata being accumulated, the facial recognition, where's the line of any military use of that here in this country? We have here at Northwestern, Eric Holder defending assassination by drone and the Tuesday assassination list said, uh, due process does not mean judicial process. So don't think that people in the rest of the world have any judicial process before, including US citizens, before being executed without trial, charge, or uh, verdict. So um, where does, are, is there anything, I don't know, it's been a long time since I read the Patriot Act, but I remember at the time a lot of criticism of how it was undermining, if not completely abolishing posse comitatus and the use of the US military here at home. And it seems like all of these regulations and these new laws are only accelerating that, if not finishing off the job. So I wonder what you all. Yeah, so under the. Under the AUMF, the Authorization for Use of Military Force, um, which was passed after 9 11, uh, yeah, potentially that could happen and it would be legal under you know, the government's definition of legality here. Um, I would submit that if the US government intends to assassinate someone on US soil, they would not use a drone. Uh, they would go and shoot them in their house, like what happened with um, Ibrahim Todeshev in Florida. Um, you know, Maybe not an assassination, but the FBI certainly riddled him with bullets in his living room. Um, so, you know, and the FBI has killed lots of people in this country over the years. They killed Fred Hampton in his bed. Um, you know, if the US government wants to kill someone, I really doubt that they would use a drone to do it, but that's just me, I guess. <laughs> Mike, did you want to say something about uh, that? Well, let me just talk a little bit about And pull the other mic, too. Uh, about, uh, Posse comitatus, uh, people, you know, there's sort of just this, this traditional American feel that we won't ever have the military policing Americans, that, you know, the military is, we want them to be very strong and well equipped to protect us from foreign threats, but not to be used against Americans. But the law is actually very weak. It has a, a whole lot of loopholes in it, and, uh, and all it requires is Congress to authorize the different uses of the military domestically. So what we've seen, uh, actually even before 9-11, is, is the use of the National Guard in policing roles because the Posse Tomatatis doesn't apply to it. And increasingly in, during the drug war, using National Guard to do intelligence analysis. And that is now expanded to uh, one of the things we talked about the last time I was here, these state and local intelligence centers where often National Guard and even active duty military are involved in these domestic police intelligence operations. Uh, so there is quite a bit more involvement of military assets in uh, domestic intelligence collection mm -hmm. where the rules really haven't changed that much. It's more how the rules are being interpreted. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there's just not enough transparency about how this is happening. So. It's something certainly uh, that, I mean, the interesting thing about it is it's something that I think locally you have an opportunity to get some questions because most of these state and local law enforcement intelligence centers are actually controlled by the state and local authorities. So you should go to your local reps and your state reps and say, what do you know about what's happening in these centers and who's overseeing them because the federal government gets access to all the information they collect, but when something goes wrong, they say it's not us. 
uh, not our fault, you know, go look at somebody else. So it's something that I think uh, some, some local activism can really do a lot to, to peel the lid off of what's going on and who has access to what information that's being collected right here in our own neighborhoods. This is slightly tangential, but I'm going to take the prerogative to clear up a piece of misinformation that the, the drone industry has been um, spouting out for, for quite some time now, and that is the fact that drones cannot be weaponized in the United States. Um, and they continue, this is one of their talking points, that drones can't carry weapons. And this is just categorically untrue. So I'm going to say this now. Um, government drones have absolutely no prohibition on what they can carry. There is no law that stops them from carrying both lethal and non-lethal weapons. There is a Federal Aviation Administration regulation that prohibits private aircraft from dropping things that may cause injury underneath them. <laughs> this, they say, is what prevents drones from being weaponized in the United States. I'll let you interpret that for yourself. <laughs> um, Joe. Is, are we now getting far enough from 9-11 that there's a real ground shift in the public's level of fear and their ability to be manipulated into accepting all this surveillance? So that's a question about, you know, 12 years out. And then another question is, do we fail to adequately understand how broad the spectrum of resistance to this surveillance is? Well, yeah, there was a uh, Pew poll that came out in August that said that uh, for the first time since Pew has been asking this question of the American public, uh, people reported being more worried about the erosion of civil liberties than they are about terrorism. So yes, um, in response to your first question. And to the second question, there's no question about the fact that opposition to a sort of you know turnkey totalitarian state, as whistleblower Bill Binney has called it, is a nonpartisan issue. It is not a bipartisan issue. It's a nonpartisan issue. People on the left, people in the center, people on the right, all sorts of people oppose, you know, mass surveillance. Um, and I think that we've seen in the coalitions that have built throughout the country and in Congress, for example, with the Amash Conyers Amendment that would have done away with the 215 metadata collection program. Um, you know, Justin Amash is a right-wing Tea Party kind of guy. And John Conyers is a long-term stalwart liberal Democrat. Uh, so yeah, no question about it. I mean, I think that one of the most disheartening things that I've seen, which is sort of the, the other side of that coin, is that people who are really dedicated to partisanship seem to have some blinders on when it comes to these issues. You know, during the Bush administration, even people who now are, are horrified by what the Snowden leaks have revealed defended the USA Patriot Act, they defended the FISA Amendments Act and Bush's warrantless wiretapping. Now we're seeing the opposite, where, you know, essentially apologists for the Obama administration are taking up the line that they thought was ho horrible 10 years ago. Um, you know, that said, there are lots of people, not only on the margins, but also who are, you know, engaged in, in those sort of party battles who stand firm in their beliefs, um, no matter who's in charge. So that's, yeah, it's great. And I don't really think that, I, I believe that the public is actually very smart. And I don't think it was a problem of the public um, not, or, or being afraid and, and therefore accepting this, as much as it was the public was being lied to about what the scope of these authorities were. And what has changed is now the public is aware that they've been lied to. And I mean, one of the things that's sort of shocking to me about the Snowden leaks is that the, is that the, the agencies don't seem to know what he has <laughs> because they've come out you know, saying, oh, 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 the program is only X, and then the next document drops and it says not X. <laughs> uh, and they've been caught so many times actively misleading Congress, you know, we now know because of the leaked documents that they were misleading this secret court. Um, so, you know, that sort of shows how poisonous secrecy is to a democratic society. And unfortunately, the secret part of our government has grown enormously. There are now five million people with security clearances. So, 
that's really what we have to address is how, how to make it so that, you know, like James Madison said, you know, uh, popular government without public information is a farce. We need to know what our government is doing. And even though, you know, I was an undercover agent, an FBI undercover agent. I, I understand there is need certain times for government secrecy, but that should be seen as a threat. And it should be very narrow when it's used and very short term. Because, you know, as much as, as I knew what I was doing was secret, I also knew that I was going to walk into a courtroom and everything was going to be released. So my incentive was to do everything right. Because if I didn't, it would be uncovered. In the intelligence field, you know, they clearly plan to keep these secrets forever. And only because we did have somebody who was, who was brave enough to release them do, do the American people have, have the ability to actually weigh in on what the government is doing. And that shouldn't have to be that way. So I want to just emphasize something that Mike said in passing, and that's how shocking it is that the government doesn't know what Snowden has. Um, and I want to do this because I think this is a point that Kevin made in his production, and he's not here right now to say it. Um, Epic got documents under FOIA about one of the government cybersecurity programs called the Defense Industrial Base Cyber Pilot, which is no longer a pilot, it's implemented in full, that shows what, to what extent the government thinks that they can monitor the networks of contractors. And basically, under what we've seen, they think that for any individual that works at a defense contractor, they can monitor everything that they do on their computer, from sending personal emails to surfing the internet to looking at government documents. And to me, it was shocking, having seen these documents that show what the program is capable of monitoring, that obviously they weren't implementing the full extent of those monitoring capabilities. Do I think they're doing that now? Yes. Do I think that's going to chill the ability of people in the future from revealing the existence of abusive programs? I do. I think also that this program, the Defense Industrial Base program, has been expanded to all critical infrastructure industries. So it's no longer just a problem of defense contractors. It's also energy. It's also um, any number of critical databases, um, communications, telecoms. Um, so that we're having our people who are in the best position to sound the alarm about government abuses 100% monitored at all times. And I'm not saying that's good or bad because I'm sure it does a lot of good things, but there's also some very vast chilling effects. I just want to make a very short observation about the uh, nonpartisan nature of the growing movement to take back our privacy, which is that in the Illinois drone bill, um, we had uh, many members from both political parties in both chambers sponsoring our bill, and the bill passed by overwhelming majorities, including a majority of each caucus uh, in both houses. Uh, and there was a lot of, uh, just for example, downstate Republicans who completely got it. And when a prosecutor says that, you know, just like we're allowed to use a helicopter to look down, you know, on your backyard without a warrant, we should be allowed to use a you know, drone to look down on your backyard without a warrant. And these, you know, rock ribs, downstate Republican legislators say, why are you allowed to use a helicopter to look down in my backyard, you know, without a warrant? So I, I think that a lot of people in all parties get this. Our former president, Lester Jackson, has something to say to you. Uh, good, good, good afternoon. Now let, let's give our, I know you're enjoying this, give our panel, uh, both panels a hand. I think we're all, uh, okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to ask you to give the board uh, a hand and my president a hand. Uh, all right, okay. And our uh, friend of uh, some of the old timers probably remember Richard Crowley who was a convener and founder of the Chicago Committee, and uh, who traced his ancestry all the way back to the sign of the Declaration of Independence. And he had one ancestor who was uh, killed uh, because she was accused of being a, a uh, witch in, uh, in Massachusetts. And, uh, and he was, uh, he was, uh, had, he was a, a member of the Army Intelligence in France during World War II and worked with French resistance <laughs> against fascism and Nazism there. Uh, he was totally committed 
to defending the Bill of Rights against government encroachment. And uh, since he passed from the scene, the leadership of the Chicago Committee has kept the faith. Uh, when the Homeland Security and the Patriot Act uh, was signed and sealed and printed, uh, uh, the Chicago Committee went to our Congressman Danny Davis, who was one of the most progressive congressmen in, the, in Washington, and asked him to get us a copy of that uh, bill, uh, Homeland Security and Patriot Act, 300 some pages. We had uh, that uh, printed, about 30 copies of that printed, and distributed them among people throughout the city who were committed to doing something about it, to organizing against it. And uh, we were able also, with the help of Congressman Davis, to bring uh, uh, the uh, congressman from Detroit uh, uh, to Chicago, and uh, who was then, I think he was a ranking member of the Judicial Committee, who spoke in mass meetings and everything. So we've been, and uh, this organization, uh, uh, you may be aware the old timers know, uh, filed charges against the city on the uh, Red Squad and, and, and re received some kind of uh, agreement on that. We, uh, the, the founder and this organization fought McCarthy's committee and McCarthyism. And uh, so we've been consistent and, uh, and, and as you see what we're doing here today reflects that. So I would hope that you would think we're worthy. We're, we're pleased to have uh, a young uh, 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 generation of board members who are carrying forward. Uh, stand up to uh, Ryan and, and are there any other our board members here? So we're here to stay. Chicago committed, the work goes on, the beat goes on, and those old timers, we know what McCarthyism is, how many people were destroyed. Now this is even worse. Because uh, I, when I read, I read the, the Patriot Act and Homeland Security, and they got millions of billions of dollars just to do what we're talking about. So you can't hide anymore. Some of us used to you know, uh, work in secret uh, for, against the Smith Act, against what, what, uh, the things we were concerned about. But you better be committed. I tell all the youngsters, you better be committed. You better know what you're doing and be committed to it and be willing to suffer the consequences. Cause uh, the government fights back, and they are vicious. And all you gotta do is, and I would just suggest in closing, I know you've got your checks written, I would suggest that, that you know, I was a, a young 15-year-old occupation soldier in Germany in 51 and until June 52. And I was uh, looking at, at the downtown buildings, all in Mannheim anyway, uh, that were gutted. And I wondered, how could this happen? But when, uh, did, well, were the German people to blame? Was it just Hitler? What? But after 9-11 and Homeland Security that they signed uh, without even reading it, then I understood how it happened, because it's happening to us before our very eyes and we don't understand it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll proceed uh, then to the next portion of our uh, program, and uh, that involves, uh, first of all, if Amy can <laughs> rise to the charge again here, uh, the long-awaited um, Skype interview that was done around midnight last night with Tom Drake, uh, one of our most important wh right. whistleblowers. All right, hey Tom, thank you for speaking to some of the attendees. Uh, can you talk about your trip? Uh, what, what was it like to meet Edward Snowden? Well, meeting Edward Snowden was quite remarkable. It's not every day you get to meet a U.S. whistleblower who's been granted political asylum in another country, in this case, Russia. We spent a number of hours with him talking about a whole range of subjects. Uh, he's He's... He's truly a remarkable person and very centered, very engaging, has a wicked sense of humor, uh, very up on world events, um, following everything he can in terms of what's going on in the United States, the response to all the disclosures. 
I think he was concerned early on that the disclosures wouldn't cause much of a ripple, let alone a discussion. Um, we ensured him based on you know everything that's been going on that that's certainly not the case. And he certainly, I think, quite gratified that we were there to award him the Sam Adams Associates Integrity and Intelligence Award. And uh, just uh, based off of what people were getting to read from him because of the excellent James Risen story that was put out um, in the last 24 hours, detailing him, uh, addressing the, the way he's been maligned and accused of being compromised by Russian agents and uh, the sort of uh, allegations that have been made uh, against him about uh, being a, a bad person when he was at the CIA and violating his authority and um, and then talking about some of what like inspired him. I, I mean, is there anything um, you would have to, to say about um, the content of that? Does that, that? That tracks pretty much with a lot of what he was possibly telling you? No, it completely tracks uh, with the wide range of discussions he had, even on, on a quite personal level. Uh, the thing that I'm struck by in terms of those who would malign him is it's the it's the classic attack on the person it's it's the traditional attack on the character of a person particularly a whistleblower which avoids the substance of what they actually disclosed and i but i recognize that that's that's a classic technique when you don't want to have to deal with the substance of disclosures and his are quite extraordinary i mean he really he recognized what had been occurring over the past number of years. He saw what happened to me and others. And he knew that with what he was eyewitness to, it was clear in the public interest, but how do you get it out in a way that it can actually be made available to the public so they can actually make up their own minds about what their government's been doing in secret behind their backs without their consent. And in this particular case, uh, with all that's happened and transpired since 9-11, you have to escape the United States, have any hope of ensuring that the material actually get into the right hands for disclosure, you know, through reporters and journalists. And that was in, in the persons of Glenn Greenwald and Laura Portress, and also have any chance of securing or ensuring his own freedom. Recognizing that the United States would throw everything they had to go after him and bring him back. And uh, you know, do you have flashbacks? I guess for people who aren't terribly familiar with your story, I'm, I'm not going to rehash it here. Uh, there, are, there are ways that people can go online and, and, and read the full story. But in meeting him, do you, do you have flashbacks to aspects of, of what happened to you? Well, the first thing I was very present to is he standing on my shoulders and others. And... Also, extraordinarily grateful because it, was, it had been my hope for the last number of years that other people within the system would also come forward like I did. And he certainly did so in rather dramatic fashion with the, the information and the evidence about how far the United States has gone in violating you know, any number of statutes and laws, even those that are currently on the books as well and fundamentally as well as the Constitution, the Fourth Amendment. But not just the United States, also the rights of citizens uh, in other countries as well. And it, one of the challenges that I thought that I had seen was, would we be able to have the real conversation debate that we had never had since 9-11? Uh, that certainly has been triggered and then some uh, by, by his disclosure starting in June. One of the unique things is that he had the courage to actually, and it's, it is unique, to actually disclose himself as a whistleblower. Uh, historically, uh, that's usually not done. Usually the whistleblower remains anonymous. Um, but I think given the circumstances, but let me, let me put it this way. I've relived the past 12 years as a result of the last four months. And, you know, I was eyewitness to the very, be very beginning stages of the surveillance state as it metastasized shortly after 9-11. And that was during a period in which th those secret surveillance programs uh, were started and conducted in the deepest secrecy, and then simply grew from there by leaps and bounds. No one had any public knowledge about these secret surveillance programs and how far they had, had gone until the Rise and Licklaw article in 2000, 
in five. And so, you know, seeing James Risen's name on the masthead, you know, under underneath the title of his article, you know, I did smile when I read when I read it. I mean, who better to have you know interviewed interviewed uh, you know Edward Snowden than James Risen, especially given uh, James Risen's own circumstances in his in his own case. Uh, involving, you know, with Jeffrey, Jeffrey Sterling um, in the Fourth Circuit, but also going back to the series of articles, blockbuster articles that they uh, published, the New York Times published in 2005. So it's it's been quite a period of time for me. Uh, and yet here we are now having that debate. And we're really having a debate about what kind of country uh, are we, who we are as people, and how far do we allow the government to go without our consent and conducting um, the, the kind of activities that Edward Snowden uh, has so courageously revealed. And so for audience members who have been following some of the disclosures, I guess what sticks out to you as one of the most, uh, I guess, glaring, uh, dangerous aspects of the surveillance state that has been revealed? Well, the larger context is truly how vast it's become and how far it's penetrated uh, the very fabric of society in so many, uh, in various ways. And I believe there's still a lot more uh, to come out. As, as dramatic as many of the disclosures are, there's still clearly, and even based on my own knowledge uh, going back 12 years, there's still, there's still more to be revealed. What's crucial and what's so remarkable about Edward Snow's disclosures is he brought actual documentation out. And he's clearly learned the lessons from those who preceded him, including myself. He saw what happened to me and how the government tra treated my whistleblowing with respect to using every, every avenue that was available within the system. And then ultimately, I did make the fateful decision to go uh, to the press with what, with what I knew about the secret surveillance programs as well as the massive of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, in his case, he knew he would have to have prima facie evidence. The prima facie evidence that I had um, goes all the way back to the 2001-2002 time period, but that was given to official government investigators and, uh, tragically as it turns out, was completely censored and suppressed. And the unclassified information that I brought out that was removed by the FBI during their unceremonious raid of my residence and car and my office uh, down at the National Defense University, but mostly at my house, um, that, was, that was culpable evidence in terms of, of government conduct. They removed that from you know, off the street, so no one, no one knew about it. So here you have unassailable proof of just how far the surveillance system has gone, and I think there's a couple of things that stand out. One is probably the Dash 80 order, the order that um, requires Verizon uh, to turn over, and of course it's been renewed a couple of times since that was disclosed, uh, although we don't have absolute proof of that, uh, but certainly the DNI has actually publicly acknowledged the renewal of certain orders, okay? Uh, but based on the original disclosure of Snowden in June, uh, it really, you know, it's you're now seeing the actual evidence, something I had known for many, many years, both, both in, the, in the last uh, couple of years before I left NSA, but also the previous iteration of those programs, the bulk, the bulk turnover of phone numbers and mass uh, to NSA. Here you have the actual uh, rather antiseptic, um, you know, quasi extra legal text um, requiring Verizon to turn over the phone numbers of each and every subscriber, um, you know, each and every day to NSA. No, no probable cause, no reasonable suspicion, no link or even relevance to any kind of counterterrorism uh, or, or ongoing investigation. It's simply we need the phone numbers uh, and the phone numbers it makes for a rather large haystack, uh, to say it that way. Uh, that's probably... In my, in my mind, one of the big standouts. The other one is PRISM, because PRISM, in some ways, um, it's one thing to have phone numbers. It's one, and you get extraordinarily rich, rich information from, from metadata as it builds up over time, aggregates over time. I mean, that alone was a fundamental violation of the Constitution, because essentially it's equivalent of a, of a general warrant. 
and the general warrant is forbidden by the Constitution. You actually have to have the particularized warrants. So that's that's one thing. The second thing is prism. Prism really is evidence of this of the what I call the deep dark side of the partnering between government and and industry. And here you have very large companies who have vast amounts of data at 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 their disposal because of the very subscribers to which they sell services, giving the government essentially a blanket or very open access to that information, um, not just metadata, but also content. And um, that, so that's another, the other one is probably just the, um, the partnerships the NSA has overseas in which they're getting lots and lots of information about private uh, citizens, completely unnecessary. No, no requirement, uh, any standard requirement that would that is necessitates them gathering information, except they can get to it just in case they need it later. And that's the surveillance state. That's the surveillance state that that I lived under personally. It's a surveillance state that I became aware of shortly after 9/11 to my horror, recognizing that what I was seeing was setting aside the rule of law, was completely upending the Constitution, bypassing all the normal mechanisms that exist to protect privacy and rights and liberties, and just abandoning the Constitution. As I've said it said publicly, and I'll say it again for the, for the purposes of the audience here with you, is unchain the government, unchained itself in secret from the Constitution. Once you do that, then you're basically, the government's granting itself secret license to do anything it can get away with. And in this case, it became a hoarding complex, and this compulsive obsession, obsessive desire to simply acquire any and all information wherever they could get it. It kind of it kind of gives new meaning to uh, to uh, Hayden's comment that I recall going back well over ten years ago, where he told told NSA and in an executive session, we need to own the net. I don't think people fully appreciated what it meant to own the net. I get there's a legitimate role for national security. The problem is we don't have to violate and s discard and set aside all of our liberties and freedoms for the sake of security. Benjamin Franklin uh, warned us a number, you know, a couple hundred plus years ago about what would happen. You would end up with neither. And, and And, and, and then so going forward, just your brief thoughts on what you're seeing. Uh, I'll just highlight the effort of, of, of Senator Ron Wyden because I think it's one of the more admirable things um, that is developing in the aftermath of Edward Snowden that you, you've seen him come forward with some proposals. Um, and But then also Snowden saying that the dissent inside of the NSA is palpable to him. Um, and so do you think that there there are people inside that are, are are at breaking points and that there might be other individuals like him in the not so distant future. I believe that's the case. I believe there'll be others who'll be inspired uh, by Edward Snowden and the, the, the remarkable lack of courage being convicted by the truth in terms of what he was exposed to. One of the things that's important to note, he's upholding the Constitution. The, you know, the Constitution is an idea. The Constitution was a promise of liberty and freedom, and it's fundamentally centered on the individual. All the rest, okay, are, are the constraints that are imposed on government, because for all the faults and the contradictions of the Constitution, they knew that you could not have an out-of-control executive in particular, and it needed to be constrained. And what happened after 9-11 is the government unconstrained itself. And then it began this assault on the Fourth Amendment which by assault or by assaulting the Fourth Amendment, you ultimately end up taking the Fourth Amendment turning against the first, and that's you know that's it's not the kind of future uh, that I that I wish to live. And I think you know if the polls for what polls are worth, and I'm always extremely skeptical of polls, they certainly are trending in significant favor of, of Snowden. And I also think that's a reflection of kind of the age we're in, uh, recognizing uh, recognizing that. There's this thing kind of Amer in America in particular called fair play, and I think people are realizing that government is, is exceeding its bounds. And when you start seeing that not just exceeding its bounds, 
that it's actually going far beyond even the mandates that it was given, or where we actually gave the government rather wide berth to pursue the threat. And you're finding out, well, that threat has gone far beyond its original mandate. It's like, hey, everybody's suspicious now. And as I've said publicly, we're all foreigners now. That's that's not the form of a governance that I took the oath to support and defend uh, four times, nor, nor is it the one that even Edward Snowden took an oath to support and defend when he used to be a, a CIA employee. He's an oath keeper, not an oath breaker. And unfortunately, in today's world, um, you know, by disclosing the truth, he ended up having to escape the United States. He's on his way to Latin America, you know, through Moscow. And the course thing, what did the U.S. government do? They saw fit to revoke uh, his passport, making him stateless. I was, I became stateless, virtually stateless in the United States when my passport was confiscated as a result of my criminal case. And I was severely restricted in terms of my ability to travel. And anytime I went outside the, outside the local area, I had to get special permission. So he does live in Russia now under political asylum, but is he truly free? One of the conversations we did have with him is he is looking forward to a time in which he can return to the United States, but that is certainly not the case now. And the irony of all ironies is the one place he now finds himself in is the one place in which he's probably the most secure outside of the United States. <clears throat> Tom Drake is a kind of hero, I think, uh, as a whistleblower, somebody who uh, was in a very high position at the National Security Agency and saw things going on that he thought should be known. He made every effort uh, within channels to uh, reveal some of these excesses and threats to the Constitution. Didn't work. He finally went public. He was prosecuted under the, uh, correct me, by the way, anybody on the panel who can, but uh, he, was, he was prosecuted under the Espionage Act. That turned out to be a, an impossible prosecution. And uh, back and forth legally, he eventually beat the rap, if you want to put it that way. He's a free man, but his career has been massively hurt. He's working in an Apple store. The reason he had to do this um, interview late last night was he did it after work. And um, so uh, what he did recently was to go to Russia uh, to meet with Snowden, he went with some other former intelligence people like Ray McGovern, and they presented an award to Edward Snowden and talked to him about his life there and why he did what he did. And um, I think he would have told us a bit about that. If you watch Democracy Now!, you saw him recently did an interview with Amy Goodman, and I'm sure there's a number of other uh, media um, representations of his reactions to, to his recent experience. But basically, it was to show support for Snowden from people who were also whistleblowers who have felt the impact of uh, the risk that they took. And different ones have experienced different consequences. I suppose, obviously, the most severe is uh, uh, Chelsea Manning. But um, others in different degrees of punishment or uh, crushing of their, of their lives. So Snowden is presumably now uh, unable to come back to the US. He has explained himself very clearly to them uh, uh, about why he did what he did and uh, that he is not a spy working for the Russians. He hasn't turned over any intelligence material to them. Basically, he gave the world uh, this information about NSA uh, because he believed it was his patriotic duty. And he's paying a very high price. OK, you, you'll notice that we have uh, Catherine Callahan and Jeremy Stone. Uh, from the Restore the Fourth Movement who have joined the panel and they're going to be doing a presentation uh, a little bit later on the whole topic of what do we do about this challenge. Um, okay, before that, we've had that segment of Thomas Drake uh, through the miraculous invention of Amy here. And um, uh, so we have a really fascinating topic uh, that my immediate neighbor here is going to uh, bring up to us. We had just a reference to uh, witch burning in Massachusetts, and she is from the Massachusetts uh, ACLU, and uh, uh, I hope it's not on the hot seat here. But anyway, um, the interactions among different levels of government, fusion centers that you've heard about and so on, I'll leave this to Kate. Thanks. 
Um, how many people in this room have heard of fusion centers? Good, great. Um, so I am with the uh, ACLU of Massachusetts. I run something called the Technology for Liberty Project there, and basically what we try to do is expose and confront uh, government surveillance programs that um, inappropriately infringe on our rights. Um, I just want to say very quickly to sort of frame all of this that at the ACLU, obviously, we, you know, we call ourselves Freedom's Law Firm. We um, defend the Bill of Rights against the government. Um, but I, I think it's also critical for us as uh, people in the United States to think a little bit more broadly about what a defense of our rights means. Um, technology is changing rapidly. The law is not keeping up. Uh, and in, in some circumstances, like with the Patriot Act and the FISA Amendments Act, the government is actually eroding the protections that we previously had in the law. Um, for example, in the 1970s and 80s, after the COINTELPRO programs of the 50s and 60s were exposed, there was a wave of reform and we had real privacy laws enacted. Uh, after 9-11, a lot of that was undone. You know, it's funny, I'm sure Amy knows this better than I do, but when you read government documents, you know, under the Privacy Act, the government has to write documents explaining how new programs will impact our privacy and they have to post them online. It's really funny to note in those public notices how many of those notices say things like exempt from the Privacy Act, exempt from, I mean, the government just pays very little attention to the affirmative protections that were um, instituted in the, in the 70s and 80s to protect us, and where it doesn't completely ignore them, those protections are woefully obsolete. So we have laws like the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which was passed in 1986. I was three years old at that time. Uh, you know, cell phones didn't exist. The internet practically didn't exist. Hardly anybody used email. And that's the law that governs um, government's access to our emails right now. Uh, the government can read your email without a warrant if it's over six months old, which made sense in the, in the 1980s. It makes absolutely no sense now. So this is all to say that the, you know, we, we can't only think about how to protect our rights within the constitutional framework. That's a lot of what we do at the ACLU, but you know, ostensibly in a, in a democracy, we should be able to decide whether or not we want the government doing certain things, even if there is no precedent to suggest that it's unconstitutional. So, for example, with surveillance cameras, um, you know, we the, the Supreme Court has said that we don't have a right to privacy in public. That doesn't mean that we want surveillance cameras everywhere, and it doesn't mean we have to have them. So, when the government says, "Well, you know, you have no right to, you know, protest against us putting up surveillance cameras," that's absurd. Um, of course, we can. <laughs> of course, we can decide whether whether we want them or not. Uh, so, I just sort of want to frame my comments with that opening statement. You know, the way that I see it, after 9-11, a number of things in this country changed for the worse. One of them was this incredible reversal that um, has been going on actually since before 9-11 but became really apparent afterwards, which is basically that, you know, in a democratic society, we should know almost everything about what the government's doing. And as many people up here have talked about, and you probably know, that is far from the case. And the government should know almost nothing about us unless it has a good reason to believe we're involved in a crime. Um, some lawyers call that probable cause uh, and a warrant to invade our private lives. That situation has been entirely reversed. So now the government knows almost everything about us, um, almost across the board, about our associations, about our travel patterns, about what we buy, where we go, where we live, what you know, where we work. Uh, and we know hardly anything, or at least up until this summer, knew hardly anything about what the government um, is doing. So that's a just, you know, on its face, flatly anti-democratic situation that we're dealing with. The other thing that happened after 9-11, and this is what I'm going to, is going to constitute the bulk of my comments, is a flood of money from the federal government to state and local police departments throughout the country, um, mostly through programs run by the Department of Homeland Security, which was a, the lar it is the largest government bureaucracy. Um, there are numerous organizations that were folded into it after 9-11, ostensibly because one of the problems that the 9-11 Commission report identified is that the government was bad at sharing information. Uh, so, you know, putting all of these agencies under one roof was supposedly supposed to help with that. Um, in fact, you know, 10 years after, 11 years after 9-11, we see all sorts of congressional reports 
suggesting that um, DHS d actually shouldn't really exist. Uh, you know, that the mission of the organization is really confused, especially the so-called counterterrorism mission, that they duplicate a lot of the work that the FBI has been doing and does, um, and that they produce a lot of crap intelligence uh, that is mucking up the counterterrorism world instead of helping um, analysts drill down to find really danger dangerous people. So just a couple numbers for you. Since 9-11, or rather since 2003 when DHS was established, uh, the Department of Homeland Security has doled out th over $35 billion to state and local law enforcement. And this money has been spent on all sorts of things from, the, if you look at, at the documents, some of which are public um, in a project that Mike has been running called Spy Files that the ACLU of Massachusetts has contributed heavily to, there are like seven or so investment areas that DHS provides funds to state and local authorities for um, around counterterrorism stuff. And among them are things like chemical and biological and nuclear weapons uh, detection programs. Some of them are uh, search and rescue operation training and uh, coordination programs. The ACLU is not concerned. In fact, I personally, as a citizen, support the government spending money um, helping fire departments and police departments train for, you know, catastrophes and things like that. But a huge portion of this money has been spent building these so-called fusion centers, these little spy centers that are all over the country. We have two of them in Massachusetts. Many states have more than one. Um, have A lot of this money has been invested in surveillance camera networks, including here in Chicago, where $46 million was spent on Project Shield, which ended up being a colossal failure. Um, but it doesn't really matter in the surveillance business whether anything succeeds because the money will keep flowing. It's pretty much unlike any other, uh, any other part of the government. You know, it's like with Head Start and, all, and any program that helps people, uh, all sorts of requirements are made. Uh, you know, the programs have to show endlessly that they're, you know, dotting every I and crossing every T. Well, in the surveillance field, it's pretty much the opposite. You can basically do anything, screw up as many times as possible, and you know, you'll know you still get money every year. Uh, so in Massachusetts, um, well, let me back up. There's one particular program called the Urban Areas Security Initiative Funding Program, and this is a DHS program that has doled out nearly $8 billion um, over the past 10 years to major urban areas. And essentially what, what we've seen is that cities compete for this money uh, by trying to convince the federal government that they are more likely than any other city to be struck by a terrorist attack. It's sort of this perverse, like, you know, we are more popular than you, we have this <laughs> port that's really important, or, you know, we have, I mean, New York doesn't need to compete really, but it's like every other city essentially is fighting for access to this money. Um, and the city of Boston, I can tell you, has received $200 million under the Urban Areas Security Initiative program uh, since 2003. And it's pretty clear to everybody in the city of Boston that all of the money that was spent on surveillance cameras, on the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, uh, which is the fusion center in Massachusetts, in Boston, which is run by the Boston Police Department, um, on you know, purchasing access to private and government databases for these uh, detectives and analysts who sit in the brick um, to look up any and all available information about anybody they want, um, for, you know, the funds to establish the brick itself. All of this money that was spent um, on so-called uh, counterterrorism in the city of Boston did absolute jack to prevent the Boston Marathon attack that occurred on April 15th. Um, I found it really funny to watch General Keith Alexander go from saying, you know, the, the anti-terrorist so-called metadata collection program protects us from terrorist attacks. Okay, it didn't stop the terrorist attack in Boston, but it, it provided us peace of mind because it showed us that, in fact, the attack that the, the brothers said that they were going to commit in New York, there was no such attack. And, the, you know, the, the cell phone program showed us that. Um, or, you know, then we heard that, in fact, the cell phone surveillance program existed to protect Wall Street, which I thought was really funny and tone deaf. Um, <laughs> but in the city of Boston, all of those measures, all, you know, all of the money that was spent 
on so-called counterterrorism stuff did absolutely nothing to stop the Boston Marathon attack. I will say, however, that it is pretty clear that the training um, in terms of rescue and first response really did have a huge effect. So, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some ways in which some of these funding programs have indeed helped law enforcement and first responders do a better job of, of responding to, you know, unique catastrophes like that. And we saw that in the city of Boston, actually, that it was a really impressive response that, you know, through these DHS programs, they had been training with the hospitals in the area, um, and they were really successful at that. Uh, that's not a problem as far as we're concerned. Our problem is with uh, surveillance programs and endless funding streams um, from the Federal Department of Homeland Security and, and the DOJ as well, down to state and local police departments, in part because there's a really critical, um, we lose a critical point of access in terms of uh, democracy when the, the Department of Homeland Security is flooding our cities and towns with all of this money for uh, surveillance equipment. It's very, very difficult, and we have tried, and in some small cases succeeded, but largely failed. It's very difficult for civil society organizations like the ACLU, concerned citizens, to go to their police departments and say, don't take this free stuff. Um, they don't have to pay for it up front. It's free toys for cops. They love it. So whether or not it's, it's useful, whether or not it uh, violates people's privacy, these are really secondary concerns to police departments that are motivated, I think, largely by the same kinds of fear-driven uh, paradigms that are governing the, the people in Congress who authorize this funding. And I, I'm, I don't want to talk too much, but I do want to get to that in a minute. I, I just want to say uh, a couple of things specifically about the, the kinds of technologies that are purchased with, with these funds. So in LA, the Los Angeles Police Department purchased a Stingray device, which Amy described before. It's basically a little machine that tricks your cell phone into thinking it's a cell phone tower. And so, for example, if I had one in my backpack, and they make them very small now, if I had one in my backpack right now, I could um, potentially not only identify every single person in this room um, by the information that your cell phone was communicating to my device, but also uh, intercept all of your communications as you're sending them. Um, and this is done we think without warrants oftentimes. Maybe not the content interception, but certainly the metadata collection. So anyway, the LA Police Department, in a very typical case, um, applied to the Department of Homeland Security for money to buy one of these stingrays. They're really expensive um, from a private corporation called the Harris Corporation, which makes lots of money off of surveillance. Uh, and they got the money because they said, like many police departments do when they apply to DHS, that they needed to use it to stop terrorism, to find terrorists. Well, thank God there really aren't terrorists around. Um, in fact, a study a couple years ago showed that you're as likely to be killed by your furniture as you are by a terrorist in the United States. <laughs> That's not a joke. Um, you're, you're as likely to you know, have your TV fall on you and crush your skull as you are to be blown up by someone in a terrorist attack. Um, so, you know, the furniture surveillance program I'm waiting for. Um, but so since, thank God, terrorism is not actually a great threat in this country, um, the LA Police Department did what most police departments in the United States do when they receive very advanced, you know, military-grade surveillance technologies, which is that they used it to find drug dealers. Um, you know, the, the drug war was, prior to the war on terror, the primary driver of the surveillance state in this country, and it continues to be the primary vehicle through which law enforcement uses its surveillance technologies, um, in part, again, because there really isn't that much or any terrorism to speak of, um, aside from really horrible and uh, random things like the Boston Marathon attack. And that leads me to the, to the one of the things I want to close on, which is that the targets of the surveillance system um, it's, it's easy to see where this money is spent and how simply by looking at things like police from so-called intelligence units in cities throughout the country. I'm sure this is the case in Chicago. It's certainly true in New York. It's certainly true in Los Angeles and Boston. Um, using funds and powers and training and you know technologies gleaned through the war on terror uh, to spy on dissidents. Um, who pose no threat to anybody except maybe the status quo, uh, to, to um, 
target immigrants for deportation, so programs like Secure Communities. How, how many people have heard of this, SCOM, Secure Communities? This is a program that uh, essentially created a second step in a process that has happened for a long time in this country, which is that every single person who's arrested, your fingerprints are automatically sent to the FBI. So SCOM uh, adds an additional step, which is that the FBI sends those fingerprints to the Department of Homeland Security's immigration uh, cops, and they make a determination about whether or not you are legal, whether you have papers to be in the country. And if you don't, they send a note back to the local police, either saying, please hold this person, often at the expense of the local um, municipality, or they say, you know, we're coming to pick them up right now, we really want to deport this person, whatever. So this is another way in which surveillance technologies are being used um, in the war against immigrants, uh, because oftentimes those are done with uh, biometric fingerprint readers that are paid for by the Department of Homeland Security and given out to local police departments throughout the country. And that, that raises a really critical issue, actually, which is that there's a sort of unspoken quid pro quo that goes on um, when, the US, when the federal government gives in the billions and billions of dollars uh, money for the purchase of surveillance technologies to state and local departments is that they get a return on that investment in, in the sense that their reach is expanded massively. They can collect way more information about us through the local police than they could on their own. And this extends way beyond, you know, the records that the NSA is collecting about us to records of, uh, showing where we've driven everywhere we go because of automatic license plate readers that were, you know, pushed massively by the Department of Homeland Security through their grant programs, uh, through technologies like the Stingray, through technologies like electronic fingerprint readers and mobile biometric scanners that are now in use um, in Massachusetts even. So immigrants, you know, it's the same targets as usual, right? Poor people, people of color uh, in the drug war, um, certainly dissidents, and obviously Muslims. Um, the, the war on terror has spawned really just virulent uh, Islamophobia. It, you know, Mike could probably talk about some of the ways in which the um, law enforcement communities have really not dealt with the Muslim community appropriately and have uh, zeroed in, I think, to the exclusion of public safety, actually, on Muslims who are not doing anything wrong, simply are religious. Um, there are so many things I could say. I guess the last thing I want to tell you is that I think what we're up against, really, um, in Congress, with respect to all of these programs, uh, the DHS funding programs down to state and local law enforcement for the purchase of you know, expensive surveillance technology for the militarization of the police, which is something that we haven't really touched on but is totally connected to all of this, is a cover your ass mentality in DC. I really believe that. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's some sort of sinister plot coming from DC to impose a surveillance state so that the government can control all of us and read our minds or whatever. I really think that a lot of politicians are scared that if there's a terrorist attack on their watch, people are gonna say, what did you do? And if they can say, we spent a quadrillion dollars giving all of this crap to state and local police officers, giving the FBI and the NSA and the CIA unlimited power to do whatever they want, um, it gives them political cover, frankly, to say, you know, don't look at me. Ob I, I really think that that's what probably motivates of the vast majority of Obama's policy decisions with respect to this stuff is that he's terrified of getting caught holding the bag. Nobody wants to get caught holding the bag, right? And I think that that actually is kind, it's kind of hopeful in a way, if that's true, what I'm proposing, because it means that if we can convince the government that we would much rather take the risk of living in a free society and that we will not throw the bums out of office if, you know, because there aren't surveillance cameras everywhere, there was a terrorist attack or some such nonsense, then we might actually be able to work some of this back. Um, so there's the cover your ass part. There's institutional self-protection, which is really just a problem of bureaucracy. Um, but now that the Department of Homeland Security exists, I think it's gonna be very, very difficult for us to get it out, uh, which I strongly believe we should do. I don't think the Department of Homeland Security should exist. Um, and then there's one thing that we haven't touched on at all yet today, which is entrenched corporate interest in all of this stuff. Uh, the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about many years ago has turned into a domestic military surveillance industrial complex 
Um, this is a, an industry that uh, makes billions and billions and billions of dollars a year off of the destruction of our privacy, and these people are not going to go lightly. Um, you know, money is a is a really strong motivating factor in all of this, especially when you consider that 70 percent, a full 70 percent of the U.S. intelligence budget is um, spent on private contractors. Um, and that's how we get people like Ed Snowden, who was working for Booz Allen in Hawaii, um, with access to you know, the most secret of the NSA's documents. Uh, 70, a full 70% of that is contracted out. And that brings me to my final point. I'm sorry, I know I spoke a lot, which is about secrecy. Um, it's very, very, very important that we learn about what the government is doing uh, at the local level with respect to surveillance, at the state level, and certainly at the federal level. And I just want to illustrate that for you uh, very clearly. It is illustrated by the, the first leak that was published from Edward Snowden's trove, which was the Verizon business order. And this is a really great story because it's, it, it has a fun twist. Um, the ACLU challenged the FISA Amendments Act the day it was signed into law in July, I believe, 2008. Uh, that is the law that, inst that institutionalized Bush's warrantless wiretapping program. And we just this past March, I think, or February, yeah, just this past February, we were kicked out of court uh, in the Supreme Court. That lawsuit is done. And the reason that we couldn't challenge the FISA Amendments Act, the, the court said, is because it agreed with the government. We could not prove that our clients, among them human rights attorneys, journalists who communicate with terrorist suspects or their families overseas, lawyers for Gitmo detainees, we couldn't prove that any of these people had been spied on under the FISA Amendments Act um, authorization. And we couldn't prove it because surveillance is secret, naturally, and we didn't have any of the transcripts. Uh, the NSA, shockingly, didn't want to give them to us. Um, and so this is really, this, this shows how critical transparency is and these leaks are when it comes to challenging these programs in court. We are finally going to be able to challenge on the merits, which is to say the court will actually have to rule on whether or not this law, this now the one that I'm talking about now is section 215 of the Patriot Act, is constitutional or not, because we have absolutely, you know, you can't, the government cannot argue with the proof that we have that they have been collecting this information about not simply all Verizon business customers, but the ACLU itself. And that's really fun because Verizon uh, provides telecom stuff for the ACLU in New York, at Broad Street, at, at our offices in New York City in, in the financial district. And so the ACLU is now suing the NSA um, on behalf of itself, which is really fun. Um, so that we have a client, us, we have proof that the uh, program that we are challenging the constitutionality of impacted our attorney's privacy by, you know, collecting all of their self, uh, uh, all of their associational information, you know, who they call and when. Um, and so finally, we're going to get to the point, we hope, where the court will have to address the legality of this issue. And that is really a critical um, example of how secrecy shrouds accountability or, or prevents accountability, um, not just in the courts, but also in the court of public opinion. As Mike said, it's absolutely impossible for the public to assess um, whether or not we want these programs to exist when we don't know what they really do. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that it's clear to the people of Boston that the so-called terrorist surveillance program is garbage. Uh, it did not protect us from the uh, Boston Marathon attack. You know, the cell phone surveillance program certainly provided no respite for the people who were killed that day or, you know, lost their limbs. Uh, and I, I think it's also, I don't know, somebody, we should talk about parallel construction too. The other, the other issue that's so sketchy about about secrecy with respect to the NSA's surveillance programs is that it is, in many, many cases, giving the information that it gleans from these very secretive programs to state and local police officers, we learned sometimes through the Drug Enforcement Agency, 
um, and they're hiding where that information came from. And the whole purpose of this is to shield the programs from judicial review. If you never learn in a courtroom that the NSA's uh, 215 program is the reason why the cops knew that you were talking to some drug dealer, you won't have the right to challenge the legality of that surveillance. And so what they do is something called parallel construction, which is essentially they lie about where the information originally came from, and they make something up. Uh, they spy on you in a different way. They say, oh, we just so happened to you know, come across information about this person in another case or whatever. Um, this is incredibly, in fact, out of all the revelations in the, that we've learned since uh, Snowden's leaks began, this is the most troubling to me because it shows a willful effort on behalf of the government, not only to shield these programs, but to really subvert the judicial process and, ju and due process. You don't have a right to a fair trial if you don't know where the information that the government um, you know, is prosecuting you on came from. So I know I said a lot, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, you mentioned the Boston, uh, the, the Boston terrorist uh, attack. I'm just curious, what was the effect on that, of that attack on mass surveillance as we know it? I mean, you alluded to, uh, it, it made these surveillance programs look horrible because they didn't act, they, they didn't stop it, they didn't detect it. But what kind of effect did it really have? Did it scare the public or did it scare people that they knew we should have more surveillance? Did it lower surveillance? Did it have any effect at all? And I'm just curious, what that was that effect? Anybody think? So the question was, what effect did the marathon attack have on perceptions of surveillance, I guess? Well, or fear. Programs of surveillance. Or surveillance did programs the themselves. Thing? Okay. So yes, in Boston, um, the BPD commissioner, uh, Ed Davis, went straight to DC and uh, with his you know, handout, and it was filled up with money. Um, so we just got 200 million, no, sorry, that's the total. We just got $18 million this year from DHS, uh, the city of Boston, for terrorism stuff. And I think $2 million of that is gonna go to the Fusion Center, and $2 million is gonna be spent on more surveillance cameras. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, uh, Ed Davis, the police commissioner, said that next year at the marathon there would be drones because drones would protect us from something, I don't know. Um, and he also said that the city of Boston needs more surveillance cameras. So we've been battling at the local level in a number of places around Boston, uh, Brookline and Cambridge, which are both kind of wealthy areas, um, around the DHS surveillance cameras in those communities. And I can tell you that the Boston Marathon attack has had a sort of complicated, um, influence on those negotiations because on the one hand it's I think uh, helpful for us to be able to say look you know there are enough surveillance cameras the cameras that were in place on Boylston Street did the job that the cameras are supposed to do they identified the suspects uh, we don't need more cameras there are cameras everywhere every business has cameras um, the city has their own, its own cameras. Uh, on the other hand, there were people who said, um, you know, the Boston Marathon attack is evidence for why we need networked government systems like the one that you have in Chicago. Uh, we need more of those cameras. We need automated tracking. We need, you know, face recognition, all sorts of things. So it's sort of a mixed bag, to be honest. But, I mean, it was... What we're saying, and what is absolutely true, is that surveillance cameras have zero effect in stopping terrorist attacks, clearly. I mean, you know, London is the most heavily surveilled city in the world, and those cameras did nothing to stop the train bombings a number of years ago. Uh, again, you know, the, the bombers in Boston were caught, or the alleged bombers were caught on camera doing it. it certainly didn't stop them from doing it. So. It's a mixed bag, I guess. And keep in mind, I mean, one important point about the cameras, they also misidentified many innocent people who even appeared on the front pages of newspapers as yeah. the person who did it. And people tend to forget that. Yeah. It took several days before the, start, before the correct people were, were identified in those cameras. A lot of people were falsely accused before that. And I'll just add, on Capitol Hill, it's been interesting, uh, we actually had um, several members of Congress go over to Russia. Think of that. Our U.S. 
representatives had to go to Russia to get information <laughs> because our FBI would not give them the information they were seeking. I mean, that's really extraordinary. Uh, so there is a lot more skepticism on Capitol Hill about why this massive apparatus we've set up to prevent exactly this didn't work. Anybody want to respond? Uh, Mike, you rephrase it a little bit further. Sure. Uh, so let me take the second one first, which is the characterization of the period between the, the church committee era reforms and 9-11 as being good for the Fourth Amendment, because you're right, the Supreme Court uh, decisions uh, in, in Smith and Miller, which are the third party doctrine, that if a third party has your records, your bank, your telephone company, your medical provider, then you have no Fourth Amendment interest in those records, is what is the support for this argument that every document is relevant and the government has the right to access. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, looking back at that period is interesting how, and, and I think should be an empowering moment for us, because when the Supreme Court decided that, that's when the Electronic Communications Privacy Act came out, that, you know, that the American public said, oh, the Fourth Amendment doesn't pre protect us? Well, Congressman, I want to make sure we're protected. And, and, you know, so laws were put in place to protect us, and obviously those laws have been weakened over time. And, reinterpreted, uh, but, you know, even where the Supreme Court fails us, uh, that's why we have Congress, and, and they can pass laws that, that will uh, correct those decisions. So the question was, um, what proposals are on the table to reform the FISA court? The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court was set up in 1978 in order to approve surveillance, um, not to interpret law, which is Again, I'm, I can speak generally on what's on the table. I think Mike would have to speak about the specific proposals. But one of the things that's out there is making sure that the FISA court cannot interpret the law and issue opinions that change um, the standards under the law and therefore are secret law because the FISA court operates totally in secret. Um, you actually cannot even get off the elevator on the floor of the district courthouse where the FISA court is, or if you do happen to get off on that floor, you are directed to get right back onto the elevator and to continue on your way. That's how secret the court is. Um, so first is to make sure that the FISA court isn't issuing secret law. One of the other main um, provisions that are on the table is to, is to instigate a system where there is an advocate that would fight against the government on certain issues where the FISA court was issuing opinions, for example, in order to argue for the other side. One of the key criticisms, again, is that it is not a, um, a traditional court because there is no adversary, there is no controversy, because it's just the government um, in front of this court in ex parte proceedings, which means no other side. So they have sought to ha introduce a other side into these debates. Um, one of the key problems with a lot of the proposals is the failure of transparency. They, they're not considering transparency when they're talking about the advocate. So there's a great amount of concern that the advocate, if one is so introduced, is just going to become another check on the secret court with no public accountability um, for what that advocate does or, or what arguments that they're making. And there are a lot of proposals going through, but a lot of them address the transparency issue. Uh, you know, what the FISA court has always said and what the government has argued is, well, we can't release the, the opinions because the cases and the individuals are so tied in with the interpretation of the law that you couldn't redact. Where now that we see the opinions, that's simply not true. And obviously those opinions are out and the world hasn't crumbled. So, you know, this isn't, isn't an, a difficult thing to do. The, the FISA decisions that change the law need to be public because the public deserves the right to know what the law is. So that's really where, where we're putting our uh, efforts is to try to make sure that we have that transparency and to actually change the law. Because the other problem with the advocate is if you have an advocate in this secret process, but the FISA court laws, it, legal interpretations stay the way they are, what's the point? If the Supreme, if the FISA court has already determined relevant means the government can, has, can have everything. What is the advocate going to argue, <laughs> right? We need a change in the law. And, you know, certainly there, there are probably good suggestions for how to improve the process, 
but the process isn't going to change it if the law doesn't change. So we need to change the law and then have transparency because sunshine is always the best disinfectant. Why did they share it with other government? Okay. Yeah, let me just so so in response to that, I would just say that I don't think that the um, politicians that elected officials, by and large, are motivated by a desire to control the U.S. population through surveillance. I really don't. Um, I really do think that they want to get elected. And so, like I said, there's an interest in terms of um, not bucking and rather endorsing policies that enrich the military surveillance industrial complex that I think is very real. Um, I also think that they really are afraid of uh, having a terrorist attack occur on their watch and, you know, get political, you know, essentially lose politically as a result of maybe not having done, you know, privacy violative things that ostensibly um, would stop terrorist attacks. And I, I kind of agree with, I think, a part of what you're saying, which is to say that I think that the intelligence agencies themselves actually do crave power at the expense of civil liberties. And I think that they do understand that all of these surveillance powers are much more about political control and the maintenance of the status quo and not really about terrorism. I think that maybe some politicians get that, but that the political reality for them, up until now at least, has been largely a cover your ass issue. So I guess I just, I disagree with your, uh, I think, implied assumption that the US government is a monolith. I don't think that's true. I think that uh, the intelligence community is a set of institutions that is quite separate um, from our elected officials. And I think that they are motivated by different things, frankly. Anybody else wanted to comment on that? Just quickly, and I think it's because I have ACLU to my left and my right, so they're rubbing off on me. <laughs> um, I'm going to say something that was actually recently published in an ACLU blog post by um, Jay Stanley, which was that there can be a lot of different things going on at the NSA and a lot of different motivations, and one of the key problems is that we don't know what those motivations are, and the fact that they can exist in its own right is a danger to democracy. So it's not what they are or what their motivations can be or what they're doing. It's the fact that we don't know. And I think that's one of the main dangers that's out there right now. I mean, but in, the, in US history, like if you look back at even what J. Edgar Hoover wrote in his diary, I mean, he was explicit about the fact that these surveillance programs were meant to you know, protect power, basically, and to protect his interests. Um, and so I don't think that, I wouldn't ascribe, uh, I guess I'm saying I wouldn't ascribe benevolent motivations to a lot of the uh, heads of the intelligence agencies. But I, and I don't necessarily think politicians are benevolent either. I don't think that a cover your ass um, political maneuver is legitimate in any way. I, but I really do think that that's what a lot of them are motivated by. Yeah, I mean, this, this actually brings up, so the question was, you know, can, can they listen to you even when you're not on your phone, through your phone? And the answer is yes. And this uh, brings up an issue that was raised by the recent Washington Post story about how the NSA targets or collects information about people who the CIA then targets through its drone strike program. Um, I, th I thought that the most important part of that story was actually that the Washington Post journalists found in the NSA's own records zero reference to the 215 program or the 702 program. These are the mass surveillance programs that organizations like the ACLU are trying to fight. Um, zero reference in these targeting documents. So when the, when the government actually wants to go after someone who it really thinks is a dangerous terrorist, they don't use these mass surveillance programs. They use malware. Uh, they drill down into specific machines. It's very targeted. They go after specific computers, uh, specific internet networks, specific phones, um, and pull out information on very specific people, which I think you know, is a little scary in the sense that if you're a target, you're basically screwed. There's nothing you can do to protect your privacy. They will get all of your information. Um, but it buttresses our arguments about how these mass surveillance programs, in fact, are about control and not security. Because even when the NSA knows, you know, goes after someone very specific, it's not, they're not using these mass surveillance programs to do it. They're using highly targeted 
malware programs that do what you just described, basically, and many other things. All of you, thank our wonderful panel. Uh, I, I, I